Welcome to the Renaissance and welcome to this edition of the Nigerian Army and the Slave Trade Part 2. Recall that in the previous edition, we tried to prove to you that the Nigerian Army you see today was formerly a slave raiding army belonging to the Sultan of the Fulani who is the head of Muslims in what was West Africa at that time and uh, how it was rebranded from the militia slave raiding militia it was to Nigerian army sometime around July 1863 following the Emancipation Proclamation by President Lincoln which came into effect in January of the same year. So contrary to what the Nigerian army posted on their site because everything about Nigeria unfortunately is a lie. They claimed that their army was formed um, in 1863 when 18 houses were gathered by Glover. But we shall show you what the army was like prior to 1863. Then look at how colonialism succeeded the slave trade. And then look at how the slaves were procured. And then get you to ask yourself a simple question. If they had 30 to 60,000 troops with which they raided slave for slaves, how did these troops disappear to a point that they now needed 18 people to start an army by 1863? Then you will be able to see the transition and then understand that the mainstay of their economy at that time was slaves. It was what oil is today. So if they suddenly ended the slave trade in 1863 because of Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, where did the 30,000 to 60,000 troops to disappear to? Did they just ask the troops to go home that the slave trade was over? The answer is of course certainly no. So let us, as usual with this channel, look at historical books and bring out the facts. Before we do so, we will need to first debunk the lie that says that Nigeria was created in 1914 or 18 whatever and that the name was coined from the river Niger by Mrs. Flora Shaw who later be became Lady Lugard. So that way when we debunk that, at least the mere fact that you have been lied to once, twice and a number of times should tell you that they are liars. So let us quickly look at some historical facts first. So let's quickly look at what they tell us was how the name Nigeria came about. This is what you have in Wikipedia. This is what we and most every Nigerian is taught in school that this is how the name came about so that you can see how their lies crumble at the slightest application of common sense. So we were told that the name was coined in the late 19th century by British journalist Flora Shaw who later married Lord Lugard, a British colonial administrator. The origin of the name Niger which originally applied only to the middle reaches of the Niger River is uncertain. So now they tell us that this woman coined the name in the late 19th century which we will assume to be between 1890 and um, 1900 or perhaps 1863 whenever they said it. But then to get it very clear let us look at the book published in 1862 and we'll see Nigeria inside it. First we we'll see that um, the journalism career of Flora Shaw was sometime in 1890s and then they said all the places she visited there is no mention of where she came up with the name and there is no mention of where she could have and to further see how their lies do not add up let us see when Lugard himself came to Nigeria so assuming they are telling us that she coined the name before she became came anything what were they talking about where what meeting were they in and who and who were there to have seen her coin the name now you see from the same wikipedia page and from available records Lugard himself came to what you would call southern nigeria protectorate or nigeria or negro land or negrosia whichever one you choose in 1900 if she coined the name before 1900 where that coming to be okay let's assume she's coined it as a, a lady that was unmarried at that time and a journalist so how do this relate okay let's look at it one step further so you look at the page it shows us that Lugard was in office from 6th January 1900 to September 1906 as the High Commissioner of the Northern Nigeria so at which point did the woman coin the name okay 
By 1907 to 1912, he was governor of Hong Kong, and by 1912 to 1914, he came back and the fraudulent amalgamation was alleged to have taken place, which no one knows how it happened because there were no witnesses. So it means they could have all lied about it. So to take it one step further, if we reference a book called Life in the Niger or the Journal of an African Trader written by William Cole and published in 1862, Note 1862, this is one year before the so-called Nigerian army came into existence. The reason we are referencing this material is for those who say, oh, there was nothing like Nigeria in 1863 because all their belief and minds are set on the lies of how it was uh, Flora Shaw that coined the name. So the book clearly tells us that I have great satisfaction in observing that my security is very contented, so much so indeed that he would like his master to linger in the permit. Thirteenth, a trip to Onisha by the author and five Nigerians. So if there was no Nigeria by 1863, how could a book that was published in 1862 have Nigeria in it? Again, if we reference another book called Nigeria, Our Letters Protectorate by Charles Henry Robinson and published in 1900. Remember it was this 1900 that um, Lugard came to the place. And then remember also that it could have taken six months or more for this book to have been written. Looking inside the page, we see that the date was February 1, 1900. So that tells us that it was written sometime from 1890 something, or maybe 1899 to 1900. However long it took the, write, the author to write the book, we at least know that Nigeria existed by 1862, Nigeria existed by 1900, and let us reference another book also. So if we reference a history of the colonization of Africa by alien races, written by Sahari H. Johnston and published 1899. We see that there is Nigeria in the book. So we see where it tells us that in 1890, British claims to a vast Niger empire were recognized by France and Germany. Unhappily, the French recognition was allowed to remain too vague in regard to the northern and western boundaries of British Nigeria. So by 1890, it tells us that Nigeria was there. So from 1862 to 1890, we are sure Nigeria was there. Let us then reference the book written by Flora Shaw herself and published 1905 to further prove that there is no way she could have been the one that coined Nigeria. These are all lies by from the slave masters. So if we reference a tropical dependency, an outline of the ancient history of the Western Sudan with an account of the modern settlement of Northern Nigeria written by Flora L. Shaw and published 1905. Notice that the other books were published before her and all those people did not say they coined Nigeria. It is only her. But let us look at her own account to show and prove that she never coined the name and the name was actually perhaps derogatory. But because the slave masters are using their lackeys and minions to enslave the whole area, many people will decide to run with the lie. So the person they, are, they claim or are late was who coined the name from River Niger is telling us in her own book written in 1905 that Nigeria as we call our latest dependency is not properly a name. It cannot be found upon a map that is 10 years old. It is only an English expression which has been made to comprehend a number of native states covering about 500,000 square miles of territory in that part of the world which we call the Western Sudan. Ancient geographers call the same section of Africa, sometimes Sudan, sometimes Ethiopia, sometimes Nigritia, sometimes Tekro, sometimes and more often Genoa or Genoa, which by the Europeans custom of throwing the ascent to the fore path of the world has become Guinea. Sometimes they call it simply Negroland. So from what she said that the name cannot be found in a map more than 10 years, it is clear that she also got it the way others did so there is no way she could have been behind the farming your question should become why do they lie everything about nigeria is a lie they tell lies every step of the way if they don't have anything to hide why do they lie why can't they come out and tell us the truth 
about how the country was formed. The truth about it is the Nigerian army you see today was the same army used to capture and sell the Negroes because Islam and Christianity at that time preached that Negroes were not human beings but were beasts lower than cattle which we had shown in some previous series. So if you see someone jumping around today to tell you no, it was Christians that enslaved us, ask the person to tell you who captured the slaves and sold to the Christians. So when you hear African kings sold slaves and all that, and then you forget that the main big elephant, the national armies like the Nigerian army was actually the slave raiding army that did it with their power as though they were, they played God actually. So your comparison should be the local refineries you have in what is called Niger Delta in Nigeria today and the big refinery that belongs to Nigeria as a country. In future, you will see that the narrative, the story, the change, the lies will be turned to mean that it was the same Niger Deltans that used their refineries to destroy the environment. Nobody will even mention the big refinery you are looking at again as what the national army was doing at, at this time the same way they did the slave trade the same thing same scenario so now that we have debunked the idea that nigeria came into existence whether in 1914 or 1890s we can go ahead and show you some of the things that prove that Nigerian army was the slave raiding army. So if we reference a book called Houserland or 1500 miles through the central Sudan by Charles Henry Robinson and it was published in 1896. It shows us that the country shows some degree of barbaric civilization. An army of 30,000 men having been kept up by the Sultan. The soil is fertile and produces abundant crops. The Bornu breed of horses is also famous. Slaves, ivory and ostrich feathers have been hitherto the principal exports and curtains and other European goods, sugar, etc have been imported by way of the desert a profitable trade might no doubt be ex opened with the lower niger so on the left you see where it says wares includes beside gold dust ivory slaves salt netron earthenware and many other commodities so you notice that a recurring decimal is the slaves and if you have not looked at how they acquire the slaves you may not understand so if we look at from the same book, we see where it tells us that Bagudu is one of the fairly innumerable sons of the Sultan of Sokoto and supports himself by moving rapidly about the country, pillaging caravans and raiding small towns and villages. The absence of the king had probably emboldened him to make an attack upon so strong a town as Zaria. So at least we see that even the son of the Sultan was a slave raider so we don't know how best you can i mean raiding for slaves you don't come and preach and people follow you they made it look like the negroes were animals like cattle if you know if you have seen a herd of cattle moving with the fulani herdsmen and they flog the cattle when it moves to a different direction that was how the negroes were classified at that time so now the muslims saw the negroes as cattle and they were capturing them and selling to the christians so the essence of telling you that the slaves were recruited or were gotten from one thing or the other or where local chiefs uh, fought themselves is a big lie because it doesn't capture the whole story it doesn't tell us how let's look at some slave raids because if you look at how the slaves were acquired there is no way anyone can say it is two communities fighting. It's impossible. Again, if we reference the history of a slave by Harry H. Uh, Johnston and published 1889, we see what happened when they came back from a slave raid. So this is the narrative of a slave captured after a slave raid. And it tells us that before we got into the town, the Sultan came out with a lot of his soldiers on horsebacks to meet his army, which he had sent slave raiding. And he was mightily pleased at the number of slaves they had obtained. There was a great firing of guns and shouting and blowing of horns and lalilooing so the essence of capturing this is to tell you what happens at that time they were doing it as if it was a religious duty both the christians and muslims saw the negroes as non-human 
and pagans for that matter, they saw it as they were actually doing the work of their God because it is not the almighty creator that they both call. So again, if we go one little step further, so again, if we reference the book, the modern, the history of slavery and the slave trade, ancient and modern, the African slave trade and the political history of slavery in the United States, and it was published in 18. 60. So we see what it tells us. So here we see that it tells us that if the inhabitants make a stand against him, a battle ensues in which the invading army is generally victorious. As many are killed as may be necessary to decide as such indeed is the case. And the captives are driven away in thousands to be kept on the property of the victor till he finds opportunities of selling them. In 1794, the king of the southern Fulas, a powerful tribe of Negritia, was known to have an army of 16,000 men constantly employed in these slave hunting expeditions into the neighbor's territories. The slaves they procured made the largest item in his revenue. So are you trying to tell us that by 1794 they had to 16,000 troops. By uh, 1820s and 30s they had about 30,000 troops. And then by 1863 when Lincoln made the Emancipation Proclamation is when you are now telling us that they needed to eat 18 people to start an army when they already had a standing army. Now compare what they are saying today with what is happening in Nigeria where even little disagreements they deploy the army because that's exactly what the army was formed for. The army can never fight any other country in that region. It is exclusively for enslaving people. That is what it is done. The Europeans and Americans provide the logistics, the military training which you can see. We can even go a little further to say that the one may be called the Christian, the other the Mohammedan slave trade. The main difference between the two trades was that while the Europeans generally bought slaves after they had been captured, the less fastidious Turks captured slaves for themselves. We have been accustomed to interest ourselves so much in the Western or Christian slave trade that we have paid but little attention to the other. While the one trade has been legally abolished, the other is carried on as vigorously as ever. A traffic in Negroes is at present going on between Negroland and the whole of the East. While it has been declared illegal to carry away a Negro from the coast of Guinea, Negroes are bought and sold daily in the public slave markets of Cairo and Constantinople. So you see that there is no way anyone will tell us that from an army of 60,000 by the Sultan, they disbanded them and sent them home. If anyone wants to tell us that, let him prove it to us. There is no way you will go and capture, take 18 people to start an army when you have 60,000 troops already. These are lies they told us, believing that nobody will care to check. But a lot of people know today. But the problem is they use their mainstream to spread false news and propaganda. Let us quickly see the casualty rates so that you understand that it is impossible for one local African chief to have been able to capture 100 or 200 people. The reason they still keep telling you that narrative is to make you think that the Negroes were so senseless. They were like animals. They had no brains. That's the only reason anyone would tell you that um, they were captured, squeezed into a ship and then brought into uh, the farm to come and become slaves and they agreed they made it look that way imagine where what the negro houses look like that a chief will have where to keep 300 men at that time so if we quickly reference african slave trade by john nilton and it was published in 1788 we see the following narrative it tells us about the death of uh, slaves in the middle passage so that you understand that it is impossible for the kings even if you think it was the african king when they get to the coast let's assume the negroes were do that dumb and stupid they get to the coast what happens these are done under the force of arms and this is well professional military professional army the army for example if you looked at nigerian army today it is a useless institution. It has no value whatsoever to the nation. It is just used for the same purpose it was created for, to intimidate, terrorize, and kill 
the innocent citizens that formed that country. The training and logistics and weapons are provided by the Europeans and Americans. So, and if you looked at it very well, there is no reason for the army. The money for the army could have been, imagine, imagine if Nigeria has 200,000 strong army. That is, they have 200,000 people waiting to be called upon to start killing themselves. That's just what the army is. So this is why you see that the Europeans and Americans provided the training. So your question should be to start asking yourself, what is really the duty and function of the army and what use is it for? If we used the money we used to pay the army, equip them because the military clothes, the weapons, the gadgets, the teaching, the education and all that come from the Europeans and Americans. So if we use the same time and energy we use to train people on how to kill their brothers and sisters and use the money to channel to something like education, to channel to something like research, to channel to something like healthcare, it will, it will make Africa a better place. But unfortunately, the Europeans and Americans use those armies because when they train them, they brainwash them, they make them start seeing even their parents their brothers and sisters as enemies. And that was exactly the same technique they used for the slave trade. The same way, the same system, the same people, the same army. So we see from that account the number of slaves that die in, this, in the Middle Passage, which many people today do not even talk about. The Negroes in um, America keep thinking that, oh no, the Negroes back home sold us. But they forget that Africa has many much more races than Negroes alone. And they still watch as the non-Negroes still oppress the Negroes till this day. So you see what it tells us that I believe nearly one half of the slaves on board have sometimes died and that the loss of a third part in these circumstances is not unusual. The ship in which I was met left the coast with 218 slaves on board and though we were not much affected by epidemical disorders, I find by my journal of that voyage now before me that we buried 62 on our passage to South Carolina. So you see what we are talking about? 62 died. Then, well, a lot more died. There are some that you will see almost 100. And. So now, if you're telling us that, oh, no, the African kings just grab somebody and they put them in. They, when you look at it, you will think they put them on the ship and they sit down. No, they are loaded like animals. In fact, when a slave runs away, it's considered that the devil has possessed that slave so that you don't think they ever whether you're a Muslim or Christian, you don't think any of those religions considered you human. It's not correct. So if we reference um, the 1840 book by Buxton, it shows us how two or three times Almas saw a stubborn slave drawn, to use his expression, like a carriage by a horse across the rocks until he was dead. He cannot say how many were killed in the attack. He thinks 500 were taken along with him from cargo but many of these died of thirst, hunger and fatigue on their march to Kodofan. Alma's father and brother were captured along with him and the former was compelled to wear the pronged stick from Gobernoba to Kodofan. They are both soldiers at Soviet. His mother was seized by the Sultan of Bragara who makes expeditions continually against inhabitants of Gebel Nebo. Or whatever so but the important thing you need to capture is that the slave trade is not what they are telling you they are we have exposed their lives so they are making it look like oh no you just come and we buy and we sell and the people smile and go no it was a brutal terror it was the height of man's inhumanity to man just uh, for the case of those who still think the birth of Biafra was any different let us see um reference a book called um Slavery and the Slave Trade in Africa by Henry M. Stanley, published in 1893. This is just to show those that claim that, oh no, it wasn't the Arabs and the Fulanese that came to the Bight of Biafra to sell the slaves, the same way they sell oil today. This is just for them to understand that they need to go do their research. So now let us quickly look at this account to understand how it was. So it tells us that by the Arabs today in inner Africa, that's when the method employed by the Arabs, it says they landed at night, surrounded the selected village and then set fire to the huts 
and as the frightened people issued out of the burning houses, they were seized and carried to the ships, or sometimes the skipper, in his hurry for sea, sent his crew to range through the town he was trading with, and regardless of rank, to seize upon every man, woman and child they met. Old Town, Creek Town and Duke Town in Old Calabar have often witnessed this summary and high-handed proceeding. So now you see that Old Calabar is um, and Boni were the two slave ports in the Bight of Biafra. So when you see the Nigerian army today fighting against the agitation of Biafra, don't ever think it is because uh, self-determination is a grammar they don't understand. No, the slave trade is still on subliminally. They are still doing or doing what they were doing then. The only difference is they don't capture humans today and put them in ships, but they are still under the yoke. Because if you looked at it very well, you will see that you can't be saying, talking, just words and somebody will deploy an army and say, oh no, it's hate speech or whatever nonsense they call it. If, if they see this now, it will also be hate speech because the truth is hate speech in a, any empire of lies. So let us look at one more little um, account. So if we look at Buxton's account, it shows us the casualty figures. It says Brazil, 78,331 slaves that the annual importations into Cuba amount to 60,000, that there have been captured 8,294, and I assume that the casualties amount to 3,375, making together 150,000, excuse me. So you see that um, um, from the last account, you see why we have um, 140,000 slaves from the parts of Benin and Biafra, because the raids were not done and couldn't have been done by the chiefs. In few subsequent editions, we shall be able to at least provide you with relevant simulation of how the slave trade couldn't have happened the way the narrative goes. Finally, we also see how the Hausa history was um, destroyed. If we look at this same account in the book we earlier referenced, and it says, as regards the genealogy of the Hausa people, their Fulani historian, Sultan Bello, not anxious to glorify the race whom he desired his own people to supplant, ascribed their origin to a slave, excepting, however, the people of Goba, whom he admits to have been freeborn and to have descended from the corpse of Egypt. Curiously, the manuscript obtained by the Niger Company in Kano, which professes to carry the history of that town from mythical times to the period of the Fulani conquest, in the beginning of the 19th century gives a certain corroboration to this view. So we see again in another page, it again tells us that Sultan Bello, the commander of the victorious Fulani, while he permitted and presumably encouraged the destruction of the Hausa records, so far showed his appreciation of the importance of history as to compile from his own study of documents. Truth may be assumed to mingle with the presentment of facts colored to suit the Fulani point of view. So you see again that the Nigerian government banning history from the schools is not a fluke. It is a game they have been playing but unfortunately our people and the people, the Negroes, have refused to use their brains. Let us look at one final account and it tells us that under Askyo Daoud, military expeditions were renewed on all the borders of the empire, Meli and the Fulani provinces of the West Mosai, Bogu, Bosa, Goma, all in turn gave occasions for the exercise of military activity. It is during the military expeditions of Askyo Daoud that we get definite accounts of the contingents finished by subordinate cows. Two cows are mentioned in one of the western campaigns as furnishing 12,000 men each, which it is said was their regular contingent. An expedition was sent also into the Hausa states, and the campaign against Cassina in 1554 was remarkable for an incident which did equal honor to both sides. In an encounter between the Songhai and the Hausa troops, 24 picked cavaliers of Shagai sustained a long and desperate struggle against a regiment of 400 Hausa soldiers. So again, we have seen that there was a North standing army prior to 1863 and that it was consequent upon the uh, Emancipation Proclamation of President Abraham Lincoln that army 
was rebranded from the slave ridden army it was prior to the Emancipation Proclamation, which came into effect on 1st January 1863, and the Nigerian army was rebranded effectively around July 1863. You can see the number of troops, you can see the dates in 1554. So the reason they are being able to deceive all of us today is because we believe what they say without making any efforts to verify them. These books were written long before today and we hope you will find time to also take a little time out and research and see what you can find out. Stop believing their lies. If somebody has lied to you or in everything, in everything today, everything about Nigeria is a lie. And today you will see that they lie about virtually everything and we hope we have been able to give you some thought provoking subjects that you can research on. Thank you very much for listening and please remember to conduct your own research. Shalom.